Welcome. This is a spark short original piece about the events following a quarantine breach at an underwater facility. If you like what you hear, please consider clicking the subscribe button to stay notified of upcoming stories. It's a small thing to ask, but it really helps out the channel. So with that being said, please sit back, relax, pull up a chair as we begin our journey. Hello. Um, is this on? God, I hope it is. If anyone is hearing this, please, even if you can't respond, please just listen. I don't know how much time I have left, so I'm just going to start in hope that you hear this and understand what I'm about to tell you. Firstly, under no, and I must make this very clear, do not attempt a rescue. Something happened here. <sighs> Something I can't explain. Something that... <sighs> God, I don't know what they found down here. But if it got out in this place, this facility must either be destroyed or erased from any and all known records. Now that I've got that out the way, and since there should be no way to save us, I guess I can tell you the truth, as even if this recording gets back to the higher-ups, they will hopefully take the right steps. At least, I hope to hell they will, as these things are too dangerous to even get topside. I dare not even think about what would happen if they didn't make it up that far. They would become a new apex predator, possibly even replacing us at the top of the food chain. My name is Darren Matthews. I am, or should I say, was part of a recovery team sent in to investigate a strange quarantine and distress beacon placed by the facility here at Ocean Deep, located here in the Mariana Trench. There were six of us in total, Captain Andrew Mathias, Corporal Helena Davis, Tech Specialist Devin Taylor, and Yelena Protogoff, with security being Stephen Lenton and myself, Medical and Research Specialist. We were a tight-knit group. Each of us knew the other, had the other's backs. Should the going get tough, that we were more than likely a collection of individuals making up a whole or some of its parts. We were a family and proud of it. Our team was formed seven years ago. We were normally deployed behind enemy lines before the main forces arrived. It was our job to assess, gather as much data and intel as possible, find any weaknesses or breach in the, the defenses, anything that might give our boys an advantage before getting extracted. We normally find ourselves being deployed into hotbed locations like the Middle East, Libya, or other war-torn lands, so it was strange, yet somewhat pleasing at the time, to find ourselves coming here to investigate why this place went dark. The descent wasn't anything to write home about. Different, yes. We were more than used to power dropping in or sneaking our way towards the target, so to find ourselves on a descent was a little disconcerting to say the least. I remember just as we began our drop, seeing the clear blue sky and clouds for what I now know was the last time. The hot, humid, almost clammy conditions as we all prepared for the task ahead, making sure to stow the gear we would be carrying either under the benches or into overhead compartments. Each of us only carried a small load. That way, it won't be over cumbersome or slow us down if we needed a quick escape. We each carried either the standard issue rifle or a sidearm. Personally, I was good with a 9mm, but the others chose to take the rifle. The engines turned over on the sub as we left the deep sea vessel Sea Spray. The reason being that it's 
something bad did happen, the U.S. Navy could disavow that we had any operations in the area and that we would be left to fend for ourselves, which is why I hope they don't do that now. And if this is reaching anyone, please make sure this place is destroyed or never returned to. The dive itself took in the region of over four hours to reach Challenger Deep, the furthest known point down in the Mariana Trench. Not only that, but this is where the Ocean Deep facility lays. I recall during the drop, Captain Matthias going over the mission at hand. He had told us that the facility was a privately owned and ran programs and tests for different corporations and also the U.S. Defense Force. The facility was crewed with anything from minimal staff to maximum capacity of 12 staff on three monthly rotations. At present, due to a drop in funding, the station was currently running with just six staff, two sub-pilots, a junior medical doctor, researcher, facility engineer, and overseer. During these smaller crews, it was well documented that they would double up on jobs, so it wasn't uncommon to find the engineer taking up shifts on the communications while the doctor or researchers might take the shifts in the arboretum or canteen preparing the meals. The subcrews mainly stayed with either manning their sub or performing checks on them, keeping it in tip-top shape. While going through the current manifest, we learned the names of the current station's crew. There was the overseer, a man by the name of Chris Vickers, a well-seasoned facility operator, whom had currently served 18 months down on Ocean Deep on a three-year basis. Dixon Conahan was the engineer on duty. He seemed to have gained a reputation for being thorough and doing his due diligence in every check he made. Kaylee Yates' file was small compared to the rest. It seemed she was either transfer or on placement as a junior doctor, and this was her first tour. The researcher went by the name of Michael Becker. From his photo, he appeared to be the eldest of the group, with a file that spoke for itself, a strong doctorate, with many awards on research and science conducted in extreme environments, yet failing to win any Nobel Prizes or getting the recognition his file seemed to merit. The last two files came as a pair, George Carrada and Anthony Colasio, both whom worked as sub-pilots and marine biologists. Both had racked up six years combined between themselves, serving 30 months apiece. As we studied each file in turn, making sure to comb every inch, studying each detail before passing it on to the others, in the group. To gain a fuller picture, we were still no clearer as to why the quarantine had been activated or why there had been a cause for radio silence. No file explained or seemed to show any of the current crew dealing with mental or physical stress. No signs seemed to point to any psychotic breakdown or showed any murky past. They all appeared to be competent, if not outstanding, in their field. If anyone had a question mark hanging over them, it would have been that of the researcher, Michael Becker. It may have been an old trope, but if anything was likely to happen, it would have started there. Once all the files had been analysed, Captain Matthias made his assessment. We were to firstly proceed to the central hub. Once there, we would have full control to most, if not all, of the facility's key systems. After that, we would begin a sweep of the sections one at a time. Hopefully, it was nothing more than a down transmitter, and the quarantine had been in error, or had been placed in haste. Yet, with Chris Vickers' track record, he didn't appear to be a man whom rushed into any decision lightly. The closer we approached Ocean Deep, we began sending out standard hails, just in case this was nothing more than a down transmitter. Yet, as we waited, sitting in the pitch black darkness of freezing cold waters, at a point deeper than most humans had ever ventured, the silence was deafening. But before too long, as we reached the required depth, 
we move the sub towards the coordinates of the vicinity. As we approach the rather sharp incline from out of the inky black void, we noticed an airy glow haloed light beaming from over the cresting peak. Sure enough, as we reached the top, sitting nestled almost against the sheer cliff face ledge, stood Ocean Deep, a three-story tall complex that was circular in nature and design, almost looking like something akin to one of our ringed worlds, with the central section adopting the feel of the rings. Each of the three levels was connected by what appeared to be central shafts. Whether or not this meant there was a working elevator or handrails was yet to be discovered. On outward inspection, there appeared to be nothing wrong, as if everything was operating as it should. We made a pass at the communications antenna, checking to see if they may have sustained any damage, and yet nothing. It all appeared to be as though the facility was in perfect working order and should be able to send and receive transmissions without any trouble. This had set a tone to unsettle and unnerve the group, with a few passing remarks called out along the lines of, What the hell? And something doesn't sit right, sir. These comments were, however, quickly squashed and muted by Captain Matthias, whom ordered us to relax and focus on the task at hand. After inspecting the communications relays, we proceeded to make our way towards the moon pool, located at the base of Ocean Deep. However, this only served to heighten our already stoked tension upon discovering that the station submersible was still docked in there. I remember Corporal Helena Davis and Captain Matthias getting into a heated debate up front. From what we could all tell, we were all thinking the same thing. No broken transmitter, hub still in the moon pool. This was all beginning to stink of someone going over the edge, or worse, a hostage situation. Captain Matthias ordered all of us to get ready for a worst-case scenario, and that this was looking less like a down transmitter and more severe. Upon those words, the team began to check and ready their rifles. While they did, I locked and loaded my sidearm, just like every other mission we'd been on together. My heart started to race as her nerves started to kick in. Each of us took the situation differently. I sat taking deep breaths. Devon and Yelena both geared themselves up, placing on their headsets while making last-minute studies of the, the facility. Stephen had been the first to prepare himself, having started the minute he noticed that the sub sat in the moon pool. It was almost as if he'd had a sixth sense, yet he never showed it. He was a man of few words, but always bore an expression of readiness, even in the down times. He always made sure to keep himself within a moment's notice at battle stations. Helena had been piloting the sub on the descent, and took the break to quickly prepare herself, whilst Captain Matthias continued to study Ocean Deep, as if trying to unlock its secrets before we all entered. Once we had recomposed ourselves and allowed the tension to drop, bringing us all back into the moment, Captain Matthias turned back to Devon and Yelena, asking for options on gaining access to Ocean Deep. It only took a few simple checks for Devon and Yelena to both concur that there was another entry point if the moon pool was currently in use, but it meant using the airlock on the outer ring, which would increase our wait time by a number of hours due to decompression. As a feeling of like having a lead balloon dropped on your chest, the disgust and dismay set back in. We'd already been cooped up in this sub for over four hours. Now we were to spend even longer just waiting in a decompression chamber. Helena brought the sub round to the location of the airlock and set about locking both ourselves and the facility together. We all heard the metallic thud, followed by that of rushing air as we all disembarked, heading into the chamber. The chamber itself wasn't overly well designed in accommodating the six of us and our gear. It was basically nothing more than a whitewashed metallic walled sphere with a graded floor, a small lowered and raised platform designed in a way so that the occupants could sit on the floor and gain a modicum 
of respite. The inner doorway leading into the facility gave a small, if fleeting, glimpse of the road ahead. As the others sat, gathering their thoughts for the journey ahead, before them, I stood looking out into the facility. It was a standard for the complex of this nature, sealed bulkheads of a sickly neon yellow nature, with pipes running overhead. Metallic grill grates lined the floor of the passageway that opened up into what appeared to be a central chamber, leading to the various sections. Nothing seemed to be out of place, nor did it look as if there was any signs of foul play. It was too quiet, and all the roads led towards a hostile takeover from within. See anything that might give us an indication? Captain Matthias had asked, coming to join me in the doorway. Nothing, sir. No signs of struggle or anyone was in a hurry, I replied. Once the command level is secure, I am going to put Yelena with you, gathering as much data as possible before we reconvene to decide our next course of action, he told me. Even now I can still hear his voice. I lost count of the time we all spent crammed into the decompression chamber. All I know is that it was a relief when the automated terminal switched over from red to green. Following our standard formation, both Yelena and Devon took up positions either side of Stephen as he stood by the entry hatch. Myself, Helena, and Captain Matthias, all situated as a rear guard. On Matthias's command, Stephen turned the wheel on the hatch, all of us hearing the metallic hiss of the airlock parting as it opened fully. Both Yelena and Devon advanced forward down the passageway, followed closely by Stephen. Once they had reached the central chamber and performed their checks, they signaled back for us to join them. As much as it was a relief to be able to walk more than a few feet, I couldn't help but feel that we had entered into an extremely hostile environment. You could hear the dripping of the water from the pipes onto the floor below. The air, although being somewhat cooler, still felt heavy and constricting. From what we could see, there were three exit points leading away from the airlock. To the left, a sign above the passageway read Moonpool and Subbay. The central passageway carried on towards the command centre, while the right side led off to medical and research. I could only assume that the hydroponics Canteen and crew quarters were on the far side of the complex. As we stood studying the signs, Stephen, Yelena, and Devon had all taken up positions at each entry point, guarding our positions. Still, it all appeared quiet, so much so that you could hear a pin drop against the drip drops of water. However, knowing our first protocol, we all regrouped and headed as one down the central corridor towards the command area. As we entered out into the command chamber, I had been right in my earlier assessment that the canteen and crew quarters had been located at the far end of the complex, yet that did little to, or nothing to put my mind at ease. In front of us lay undisturbed crates filled with supplies of various degrees, medical food, research, even engineering workhouse all piled up, ready to be shipped off to various locations within the facility. On one of the crates labelled for the canteen was a clipboard with a half-filled-out checklist. It seemed that the chief engineer at the time, this Dixon Conahan, had been pulled away quickly from his job, but for what reason was unclear. Dominating the central chamber was a laddered access route leading in both directions, Knowing our destination led up, taking point as always, Devon ascended up firstly, followed closely by Yelena, and then Stephen. Once more we were all set to wait, keeping an eye out for any activity from any of the trailing corridors. Now that the main security forces were upper level, the creaking bulkheads, dripping pipes, ghostly silence and rhythmic sway of the air conditioning units added a whole new creep factor to the now expansive empty interior. Three quick blips on the radio signalled our attention that the coast was clear and all was good for us to proceed. Yet, as the blips had come through, I had unnerved myself 
mainly through a runaway imagination. Yet, as Captain Matthias ascended, firstly followed by myself and then Corporal Helena, I was glad to be back around people, yet even more so concerned of the lack of Ocean Deep crew, having already been through two areas and not yet heard or seen a soul. This was becoming ever more so troubling. The main central command chamber is unlike anything I've ever seen before. A large half dome like structure, built with raised and lowered platform levels stationed around the outermost areas for engineering, air quality control, sub relay systems, and research, while the innermost comprises of communications, medical, and a large rectangular table with sub level scans of currently investigated areas. I can see the overseer's office just over to the far right, tucked into one of the walls and I'll be damned if I ever go near or into that room ever again. <sighs> Come on, focus. Stay on track. Oh God, I'll be back. Please don't go anywhere. Hello? God. Please still be on. Come on. Get this out before it's too late. Um. Okay. So. We all began our sweeps of the command level. Operating our various stations. Each trying to make sense of what might have happened here. Captain Matthias took the break in activity to scope out the overseer's Chris Vickers office. I chose at first to begin my search through the crew's psych files and evaluation reports from the medical doctor Kaylee Yates. Needless to say, for a junior doctor or transfer personnel, she was very thorough, much like a placement student or first year rookie could be, always following the rule book before knowing which rules to skirt and which to tighten up on. Each of the crew appeared to be in good, if not strangely perfect health. No one seemed to be on the brink of breakdown, or showed any evidence of having an episode. So once I completed the download onto my USB, I moved on over to Michael Becker's research terminal. Here a command. Even though we could use the terminals down in their areas, each station was linked up to the command center. So at least there was an active backup in case one system crashed. The research reports read just like I had anticipated for a man who looked like a university lecturer and well-versed in doctorates. His reports were extremely well-grounded, almost to a point of scarily overly observant. Yet, within his files were requests from independent companies asking for deeper surveys of the unexplored areas, some that even appeared to throw the safety of the subcrews in jeopardy, each of which had an addendum attached from Michael, giving feedback saying how ludicrous their requests had been. Yet something occurred to me as I scanned through to the last recorded entry dates on both terminals. Together, Kaylee and Michael had written their last updates on the same day, two weeks prior. At first, I thought it was slightly odd, yet once we all reconvened and began to discuss our findings, we could all draw parallels to the last entries being on the same date, leading us all to surmise that whatever happened here took place two weeks ago. If only we'd have left and not checked the damn monitors. Perhaps we'd all be safe and on our way back up. <sighs> God, we were so stupid. It had only been a passing glance, and almost this is tiresome look of non-combat from Devon, who up until that point had kept a close eye on the surroundings, along with Yelena. That as Captain Mephias was busy making a plan to split us up into teams, that's when he'd seen it. Hey, hey guys, he spoke in his tough, burly accent, pointing towards the security monitors, having seen something flicker on them and then pass. As we all looked at the camera, it had changed to whatever he'd witnessed to the hydroponics lab. Of course, we'd all jibed him, saying he was seeing things at first. He'd been so adamant about seeing something 
that Stephen had taken over control of the feed and began cycling back and forth, trying to see what had spooked Devon. Of course, that's when it happened. Then we saw it, dooming ourselves and sealing our fate. At first we thought we were all looking at the moon pool. It almost looked like water reflecting off the surface of something metallic. That was until we saw and realized that it wasn't seawater at all, but a thick, far cloud. To begin with, none of us could make out which area this was. Maybe it was the canteen, or had some contaminant got spilled out into the medical bay. Yet, it was Stephen that informed us all that this was a research lab we were all looking at. Again, the expressions we all carried, except for that of Devon, was that it seemed to be some sort of contagion that had more than likely swept through from the area, and that the crew had decided to seal themselves away in their quarters or hold up in the sub-bay. All the signs seemed to point towards that, except for as Stephen checked the security logs, all but one of the crew was accounted for in entering the research lab before the quarantine lockdown occurred. Yet it was never lifted, meaning, as he informed us all, that all of the station's crew were mostly all still present in the ficked fog lab, except for the chief engineer, Dixon Carnahan, whose logs showed having him trying to release the emergency releases, yet not succeeding. As Captain Matthias' request, Stephen was tasked with replaying the last events from two weeks prior to get a handle on what had happened here. Even now, it still chills me to the core, thinking about it, as we watched, as it appears some sort of accident happened here to one of the crew, as they were wheeled into the containment chamber. Yet no sooner had they all finished that they were all backing off and bringing the liquid nitrogen chamber down. It seems something had caught Michael Becker's attention, as he looked to be the closer of the group to the glass, as the liquid nitrogen flooded the chamber. That's when it happened, as they all stood waiting, like watching a horror movie, knowing a jump scare is coming, yet still getting you at the same time. It happened. We all saw this creature in the mist attack the glass. Even now, I'm struggling to find words to describe it. It's like a collection of parts taken from other sea life in order to evolve, is the only way I can put it. It had the body of a small squid, six spindly-like legs, like that of a crab. Nothing that resembles a head, only a neckline with razor-sharp pincers on either side, and a more of sharp shark's teeth. At first, it seemed like we were only needing to deal with one of these things. But as the situation in the research lab proved, and escalated, going rapidly out of control, the second sub-pilot was pulled almost as if yanked into the fog mist by this creature that latched and coiled around his right leg. The remaining three staff, stuck within the lab, took the sensible approach to back as far from the chamber as possible. We're not sure what happened to Dixon or Chris. Dixon, due to the camera never being on him, and Chris walked out of the camera site, never to be seen again. Yet we knew he had never left the room again. As for Michael and Kaylee, it seemed they were observing Dixon for a while until turning away as if in horror of something. But they then chose to stand or sit on tables as the fog expanded in the lab. At first, I was puzzled. Now I know why. These things, these creatures, hunt on sound. They're completely blind, yet they have the best hearing or echolocation known to man. Not only that, but they wait out their prey, letting them make the first move. And that doesn't even have to be by foot. Any sound alerts them to investigate. Witnessing this had instantly changed the parameters of our investigation. We could confirm that most of the crew were dead, except for the overseer and chief engineer. It now became apparent that we needed to find them and extract them, and if possible, subdue this creature. Corporal Helen the Davis elected to stay up in the command center and follow our progress on the monitors while we all headed off to the research lab. Every step 
felt like the sense of dread and foreboding followed us, as if the Grim Reaper themselves stood shoulder to shoulder with us. None of us knew what we would encounter as we approached the lab, yet it was easy to see through the glass that the thick liquid nitrogen fog had now engulfed the entirety of the chamber. Stephen, Yelena, and Devon took a position against the door, whilst Captain Matthias stood behind them. I'd have been tasked with releasing the quarantine from the adjacent room, linking to the chamber. Captain Matthias, Chief Engineer is dead, I reported in almost stumbling over his corpse that lay strewn across the floor, his pained expression almost making me feel sick. As I took note, his body seemed like it had imploded from within, at the base of the neck, almost as if one of these creatures had burst out of him. His head was barely left hanging on to his remnants of his neck. Blood seemed to have pooled in places before drying, and spindly like feet prints looked to have crawled away from the body, using the wall to climb and then enter an overhead exposed grate. It was more than likely the chief engineer hadn't seen his attacker coming, and hopefully or mercilessly died quickly. Yet the pain of the explosion, probably not. Captain Matthias entered quickly into the security station area, noticing as I had the body. He gave me a look of, we need to get this done, before exiting. From the main terminal, I saw that Dixon, their chief engineer, had nearly got the lockdown released, and the system was only waiting for confirmation to deactivate. From here, I had a first-hand view of the research lab. The thick fog made it difficult to see anything, but that didn't stop me from looking for shapes, large or small. Anything that might seem ready to attack, but nothing. Even the exposed grate was silent. Yet taking no chances, and not wanting to get caught out like Dixon had, I kept a few steps back from the controls, with my 9mm switching my focus between the station and the exposed grate. Releasing the lockdown on your command, sir, I called out, waiting for Matthias to give the go-ahead and for the group to ready themselves for whatever lay beyond the door. Moments later, Captain Matthias had given me the go-ahead, and I activated the release button. The door couldn't have been more louder if it had tried, with the air pressure giving out an air-piercing jet blast, while the metallic locks disengaged. For a moment, I thought I saw something move. Then, as if all at once, the door began to open, and from the exposed grate, I heard loud thuds of things landing on the metallic floor and grates, before skittering forwards, the crashing of laboratory equipment crashing and clattering to the ground, and then silence, nothing for a few moments. As I watched the thick fog begin to flood out of the room into the corridor, there was a chill around my feet and ankles, as if I was standing in ice with no shoes or socks on. But I attributed this to the liquid nitrogen fog bank, and as the fog dissipated low enough for me to see the main level, I caught a glimpse of Chris Vickers laying at the far end of the lab. Just like Dixon, he too had the same explosion on his neckline. Yet, his head had com was completely missing, but a blood spray grew up the wall. The corridor was then filled with an air-piercing screech, as through the tip of the fog I could see the tips of the creatures barreling towards the open doorway. Shut the door, shut the door! I screamed, hoping someone might have had time to grab it, so I could re-engage the locks, but it was too late, as the sound of gunfire filled the corridor. Doing all I could... I quickly barricaded myself against the door to hold back those things from entering. I heard my teammates scream out in pain, and then go strangely silent. While I felt the creatures try to test the door I was holding, almost to see if they could sense me. I waited and listened, as they either moved off or retreated, yet I knew I couldn't hold up here forever. I'd have to at least inform Corporal Davis and warn her in case these things knew how to climb ladders. Corporal Davis, this is Matthew. Do you respond? I asked at the time. Matthews, what's going on? She asked, her voice still lingering in my mind, as they all do. The team are compromised. These creatures broke out. 
I think they're all dead. They might be headed to you next. Stay alert. I radioed back through, hoping she would understand. I must have sat waiting, listening out for a response for at least ten minutes. That was when I moved back from the door and slightly opened it, noticing Stephen, Devon, Yelena, and Captain Matthias all laying on the floor, unresponsive. I knew then that the mission was over, and I had to get everyone out, back to the sub, and hope Helena would be able to man the cameras, watching out for the creatures. From where we were, I could see the sub decompression chamber down at the far end of the facility. It was at least four corridors away, and the journey would be difficult. Knowing that once we were topside, command would want a debrief from the most senior officer, I took it upon myself to try and move Captain Matthias first. Man, did he weigh a ton. He was like trying to move four large sacks of potatoes. I managed to drag him three quarters of the way back when I heard the creatures moving around, so I quickly hid as best I could out of eyeline of the creatures, hoping for them to pass. My biggest fear was then realized as I caught one of them crawl into a vent shaft and make its trek to who knows where. Yet I didn't need to wait long to find out where as a hail of gunfire rang out, followed by the screeching of these things, and then they all seemed to descend on Helena's location, and just as quickly as the gunfire had started, they stopped, leaving me with no question in my mind that she had also been compromised. I was about to continue moving Captain Matthias towards the decompression chamber when one of the creatures entered into the crossroads. Panicking, I stopped and stood while edging to unclip my 9mm, which I'd stupidly placed back into its holder. It then seemed to look at me, and that's when I got a good look at it in all its horrific sight. I was sure it could see me, but it wasn't attacking. My heart was racing, and my breathing was fast, yet I couldn't move. And just like that, it took off, right past me, towards Helena. Once it crawled out of sight, I began to wonder why, and a theory started to form. Were these creatures hypersensitive to sound? Thinking about the area around me, I surmised that the sea life down here in the trench would be almost blind and would need to have a highly evolved form of echolocation to survive. So was that what this was? From what I'd seen and heard, this was likely, but I wasn't going to stick around just to test out a theory under these circumstances. I knew I had a team to save if I could. Once Matthias had been dragged back into the decompression chamber, I decided to go out to Helena as the next senior most officer of the team. I could hear them scuttling about throughout the facility. Every vent and corridor seemed to amplify the sound, like that of an echo chamber. And if that were so, this location was even more perilous now. Each step I took seemed to take an age. Down at the far end, I could still see the bodies of Stephen, Devon, and Yelena, almost in a state of comatose. They hadn't moved since the attack and I had no idea how long the effects were going to last. Every creak, warped conduits, and piping made me stop, as I could see the creature's shadows moving from down corridors. As I made to take hold of the access ladder for the command center, I inadvertently knocked a loose crate over, sending it crashing to the floor. Almost in unison, each of these creatures wailed collectively, as if in communication with the others. The sound they made was ungodly and haunting, that I knew if I tried to ascend the ladder now, I'd be dead before I even started. I could hear each of them rapidly approaching my position by various means, that I hid behind a set of packing crates that was pressed against the wall. I watched and waited and listened, as I saw six of these creatures all converge on the central location trying to find my position. One of them jumped on top of the packing crate I was hit behind. Another seemed to almost smell the air before turning towards me like a bloodhound, picking up a scent. Then, like a predator, it stopped mere inches away from me, as if looking me dead in the eye. 
I didn't move, hoping, praying that they were truly blind. They seemed to search like a unit until they gave up and each retreated, going back to the areas from which they came. I knew I was fast approaching a decision time. Do I go with Captain Matthias and sacrifice the rest of the team, or risk my own life in trying to get everyone off? A horrible realization then occurred to me. I had deactivated the quarantine lockdown on the facility, meaning that should the next team arrive, they would be walking into a bloodbath. It had never really bothered me before, topside. We were always focused on the mission at hand, but now this situation needed to be addressed. So I knew I'd have to reactivate the quarantine from the station, and if I was going to retrieve Helena, I'd be able to activate the lockdown from the command deck. As I looked out at the command center area, Helena was nowhere to be seen. I could see bullet holes in terminals which had short-circuited them, sending them offline, and I could only hope that she hadn't hit the lockdown terminal. Thankfully she hadn't, and reactivating it was easily enough. Done. Yet, I still couldn't see Helena, out among the control area. That left me with only the overseer's office, which was slightly ajar now that I'd noticed it. Cautiously, I approached the door, reading my 9mm. Slowly, I opened the door and saw Helena, comatose, just like everyone else, only looked as if she'd been bitten multiple times. Small lumps had started to form in the bite locations of her neck, arms, and legs, which all seemed to pulse and throb, as if growing ever so slightly with each passing moment. It was as I thought about it, these creatures possibly had a unique way of reproducing, much like an insect wasp can cannibalize ladybirds to serve as living hosts before the offspring eat their way out of the living host. Were these creatures the same? Their bites carrying either embryos or parasites, embedding into their victims before giving birth. The explosive situation of the Ocean Deep crew now seemed to validate this theory. And if that was the case, I could no longer take Captain Matthias or anyone else back to the surface for risk of infection. Knowing that currently there were six of these creatures hunting around the station, Helena would soon explode into five more, and my team, each of us more than likely, carrying another, meant that there would soon be fifteen very soon, to ease Helena's passing, knowing what she was going to be going through. I added the silencer to my 9mm before shooting her in the head. Hopefully that the creatures growing inside her might die without a living host to feed on. Once that was done, I made sure to wedge the door shut on the outside in a belief that this would stop those creatures from breaking loose. The camera feed seemed to show that none of the creatures were currently in the sub-bay so I remotely closed off and locked shut the moon pool doors. That way, the only way off the station is from the airlock our sub is currently attached to. It was my intent to remotely detonate the seal, flooding and imploding the station from the resorting explosion. Yet, unfortunately, Helena's stray bullet fire hit the console for that. No matter what, this station will stay under quarantine and I intend to make sure nothing gets off or out of here. The world is not ready for these things, and never will be. God, I hope you can hear me. Please, destroy this station. Don't let these things escape.
Hello Sparkshot fans, and to those just finding the channel, welcome. You are about to embark on a tale, taking two people to a destination that goes beyond their control or understanding. So pull up a chair, sit back, relax, and listen to the tale you are about to be told. But just before that, if you could please hit the like and subscribe button, it's a small thing to ask but it really helps out the channel to grow and keeps you informed of any and all upcoming stories. Thank you in advance. Now, on with the story. By the dawn of the 22nd century, mankind had dealt with a lot in its history. Mired in war, disease, death and poverty. Humanity as a species was on the brink of collapse. The last great war, otherwise known as World War III, had destroyed and crippled most of the world's population. Great countries even no longer existed, or had its people so cruelly ripped from their homes that they had been forced to flee the atomic and nuclear bombs which had been dropped upon them. The majority of the continental United States, Russia, China and Europe stood mostly in ruins, for what was left the only safe refuge for its masses was Australia. But even they couldn't take all of those that arrived at their borders. So it was left for them to fend for themselves until the background radiation had died down enough for them to safely return living no longer in the big cities and mainland towns, but on the fringes, often taking risks to venture deeper into their once great homelands, to find supplies and building materials to help them in their rebuilding process. The Great War had started in the late 2020s. No one could remember now how it all started, other than it had begun in Israel, and had dragged the whole world into its conflict. To call it a war is an incorrect term, most like an extermination. Unlike the wars of the first and second, this one didn't rage on for five years. It was over within the first few months, with the bombs being dropped, wiping out everything in their path. Yet from the wreckage of this, humanity as a people began to come together, with its nations now realising that their once former barriers no longer existed, and instead came together, putting old grudges and hates aside to once more rise out of the ashes and become a truly global civilization. And by the turn of the early 22nd century, Mankind was once again ready to take to the stars and begin again, in earnest, not as men and women from different lands, but as one nation under a healing and rebuilding world. Under the old guard, plans that had laid dormant for colonies on both Luna, the Earth's moon, Mars, and even a colony space station commenced. The lunar colony was the first waypoint to be established, being used as a springboard for ships heading out to Mars, as well as scouting Venus to run tests on floating colonies high into the clouds, where the atmospheric pressures were far from tolerable. To keep the risk down in case of difficulties, small explorer-class ships were sent out from Lunar Gateway, with a crew size max of two people, each possessing skills that contributed the others. These small crafts were by no means cramped or forced to have its crew on top of one another. The small ships were designed in an arrowhead formation, with the cockpit area designed over two levels. The cockpit would have the unobstructed view at the forward section, otherwise called the tip, while the secondary officer would take up the scientific role, with their stations set directly behind the pilot with three monitoring stations, or for various scans and data outputs, almost to a construction type of fighter cockpit. To either side of the front of the ship was the individual cabins, both designed with all possible needs, each with a sleeping bed desk and reading material, along with bathrooms. These rooms then led off to the rear of the ship, making up the dining and engineering work hubs. 
each of the ships was equipped with the latest FTO drives, with breakthrough and advancements having been made in ion drive technology, allowing each ship to cross distances between Earth and Mars in record times. Mike Williams was a man in his early 40s. He had helped and given input into the design of the Arrowhead ships. He had been given the honour of even being the first ever test pilot, making sure to put the new design through its paces before fully going into operational use. Serena Mekachenkov was a young and impressionable woman whose IQ was outstanding to say the least. It was deemed when she sat the astro exams that she could be well suited in the technical field designing either future colonies or future ship designs. Yet she had chosen to apply her field in science and had jumped at the chance to board one of the older arrowheads along with Mike. The DSV Venture or Deep Space Arrowhead Venture, given its full title as it was known, had been in operational use for close to 10 years and was starting to show its age and wear against the newer Arrowhead classes which were starting to roll off the Lunar Gateway production line. Yet she and her pilot could still match them for speed and spirit when called upon. It was as Mike had known for a while that the Terran government was looking to find a way to decommission the venture or have Mike step up as full overseer of the new Arrowhead project. Yet up until now, he had resisted, preferring the comforts and solitude of space to four metallic walls that didn't give a sense of moving, creaking, buckling, or didn't have his own signature handprint over some world or upgrade or modification he had done himself. Begrudgingly, he had taken Serena on as an apprentice of sorts. He knew that if the government did find a way of parting him from the venture, she would have a good pilot and make a good home for whomever was her crew. For him, the venture was more than just a ship. It was family. A part of him he'd put himself into, and he just couldn't leave her. Serena had taken time to settle in and learn to cope with Mike's ways of doing things at first. She tried to increase the output of the ion drives or threatened to rip them out altogether at the next dry dock but Mike had sworn he'd sooner throw her off the ship than see her touch or remove anything he'd become accustomed to. Eventually, however, she learned to accept the old ship for what it meant to Mike and worked around the issues that cropped up from time to time, helping to keep the old girl out of the scrapyard for just a little longer. But even she could see that the venture was running on borrowed time, and sooner rather than later her day would come. Yet Serena hoped that maybe by that time, Mike, or even she herself, would have enough pull to make sure the venture was the first inductee into a shipyard museum, rather than being turned in for scrap. Until that day came, though, they had a mission to undertake, to keep them away from the launch of the new breed of Arrowhead class, which was to be the third in its line, Mike, Serena, and the venture was sent out to scan for suitable colony locations on Mars, with the Venture's ion drives pushing them hard. Their journey would take roughly three months. Then the standard six to eight, which had been set by the old rockets of pre-World War III Earth. This would give the Terran government enough time to fully disband and discontinue the Type I Arrowhead ships. The journey had been pretty uneventful, with both Mike and Serena while away their time at their stations, or with Mike showing Serena how to fully understand and become a pilot. The rest of the time they had spent in their own cabins, watching old movies or television shows at the dining table, finding a few to be quite enjoyable. It had been, however, when they had arrived at the fringes of the Martian sector that Serena had detected something strange on her instruments. Mike, I'm telling you, this isn't background noise from Mars or its two moons. This is coming from beyond them. Serena spoke, 
running her fingers over the various commands at her station, trying to get fix on the location. Mike sat and waited. They had been on, on this journey now for a few months, with no contact from Earth, Lunar Gateway, or any other v ships. And Mars was still a dead world at this time. Have you managed to triangulate the signal yet? Mike inquired, getting a little apprehensive. Almost. Serena answered, more focused on her readouts than looking at him to deliver the message. Then, after a few more inputs, she hit it. Got it. Whatever this signal is, it's coming from the far side of the planet, located at a distance of 0 0.5 AUs. That can't be right. That's what it's telling me. Serena, that puts us in the asteroid field, Mike added. Leaving the pit, Mike came and stood by Serena's console, which was displaying the signal's point of origin. You know what this means, Mike said, rubbing his chin. We call this in? Serena responded, looking up to him only now starting to see the first strains of grey appearing at the edges of his hairline. That's an option. Or... He stopped, thinking about things. He knew if they rationed their supplies, they could make the extended trip. Likewise, he knew that the Terran government would be too focused on their projects to approve the investigation yet given it would mean that the venture would be away for a longer period of time, he couldn't see them having a problem with it. If we ration our supplies, we have, from here on out, and forego this current assignment, of which I'm sure that they would happily send out another ship anyway, we could make it to the signal, Mike suggested. You know that means going against protocol. Serena added. Sure, but it keeps the venture out of dry dock for a bit longer. Mike finished. Serena didn't need to say any more. She, just like Mike, were both invested in tracking down the signal. And Mike was right. They would just send another ship out here anyway, so they weren't losing anything by investigating. The following few weeks was fraught with trying to get more detailed and accurate positioning checks on the signal from the asteroid belt. They both knew that the belt itself was a dangerous and hazardous place, and they would need to know where they were going before arriving to minimalize the risk factor to both themselves and the venture. Throughout the voyage, you could cut the tension in the ship with a knife, the Terran government had gotten word of their deviation and had sent a variety of messages. The first had been of concern until the last few, which had demanded the venture return to Dryduck for decommissioning and scrapping. Mike had at first thought about responding to keep them informed, yet they couldn't pass up the opportunity. And as the final few transmissions were made, Mike had felt the need to have Serena turn off the signals from Earth altogether, rather than listen to or reading their spouting. Whatever happens, old girl, you're not being scrapped. Mike said out loud, standing in the cockpit of the venture alone, tenderly stroking his hand across her consoles and walls. Serena, on the other hand, had taken to keeping herself mainly in her cabin, or in their dining area, working on various readouts to try and get a fix on the location within the asteroid belt. Tracking the signal had been the easy part. It was a constant fixed location from the belt, and yet the wave band would continue to ebb and flow, getting closer before receding. This made getting an accurate positioning from within the asteroid field difficult. They both agreed that the continual flow possibly would be down to interference from the debris within the area, blocking the signal at intermittent times. 
both Serena and Mike, had done well to rush in their supplies by the time they arrived at the belt. They were the furthest known human crew to ever reach this distance. From the satellites which had passed centuries earlier, no one knew if they were still functioning, or what had become of them. Yet, to the romantics of deep space explorers, they still believed somewhere out in the vast cosmos. The Voyager probes were still both finding new and wonderful things. Mike sat looking out at the field from the tip of the venture, watching the myriad of rock and debris, crisscross performing the dance of death, and knowing before too long that they themselves would be joining them in their frolics. All the while, Serena worked at her station, inputting various algorithms and computations into the system that she had been working on to try and get a fix on this mysterious signal they had encountered weeks prior. Any joy? Mike inquired, his concentration breaking as he pulled himself back from his wonderment. Almost, Serena answered, more interested in the sequence of numbers and readouts than giving him her fullest of attentions. Mike rubbed his hands over the console frames of the venture, lovingly caressing her. Ready for one more adventure, old girl? He thought to himself, knowing time was not on their side, one way or another. Mike, I'm feeding you the coordinates from the system for the heading to make. It should put us within touching distance, provided nothing gets in our, in our path. Serena called out to him. Mike placed both his hands on the flight controls and watched as the calculation started to flash up on his screen. Taking a deep breath, they slowly entered the asteroid field. This time it was Serena who gazed on in wonderment, knowing she'd done all she could, and that it was now up to Mike. She observed the venture crossing the threshold, mesmerized by the sheer scale and size of the asteroids within, knowing any one of them could destroy their ship in seconds. From her position, she could clearly see ridges and rises, cold icy regions on the dark sides, barren smoothness before potted and cratered mounds, mountainous regions, some that appeared to dwarf that of Everest. Everything about this region filled her with wonder and enchantment, to know she was one of the first people to see it up close. Wow, Mike. This is incredible, she spoke, unable to contain her feelings. It sure is, Mike answered, as he bobbed and weaved through the maze. I remember old stories and theories about this place, Serena mentioned. Same. I still like the one about how the belt was once a planet that got ripped apart by the forces of Jupiter. Or so they say. Mike added. Go on, Serena asked, curiously wanting Mike to finish. No, <laughs> it's silly, really, Mike said, sounding foolish. It's only me, you, and the venture that's going to hear it, Serena mused. Mike let out a wry smile and chuckle. <laughs> okay, then. But this goes no further than you two ladies, he began. Cross our hearts, isn't that right, Venture? Serena answered, smiling back whilst placing her hand on her heart, while tapping a few controls on the Venture's science terminals to simulate that the Venture was also in agreement. <laughs> okay, you two, Mike stated, sighing before beginning. <sighs> I used to believe back in the day that the asteroid belt, apart from being just a regular planet, was inhabited, and they had some sort of catastrophic event other than that of Jupiter, of course, that caused their world to be destroyed, Mike told them. Any ideas? Serena questioned, 
listening intently. Anything from a great global quake to the planet's core is stabilizing. And apart from the rock and debris we see around us, the only other remains is the dwarf planet Ceres, which used to be one of their moons. <laughs> Silly, right? Mike answered. Not at all. That would make their world something akin to a super-Earth. The theory is still sound. According to scientific belief, in regard to planetary distances, after all, I remember reading somewhere the scientists argued that the distances between Mars and Jupiter were so great that since the asteroid belt sat between them, both something had to sit there. So it's not as silly as it sounds, Serena mentioned, recalling an article she'd once read. Thanks, Serena, for listening to the ramblings of an old man. Mike said, Think nothing of it. Besides, you're not that old. Serena added, Ever since they'd started the journey out together, away from Mars, Mike had begun to warm towards Serena, seeing her not just as a companion, but a sort of a daughter he'd never had. He'd never had time for relationships, and always felt that the venture was more like his wife than any other woman ever could. But with Serena, it was different. She had driven him crazy at start, much like a child does a parent. Yet... With time comes experience and growth, and now he felt that Serena had given him that comfort and filled the void he never truly knew he was missing. Until now. The venture powered on through the field, playing the dance of death, weaving in and out of obstacles that approached them. Serena would give Mike updates throughout the journey, letting him know that the distance they had until they arrived at the cause of the signal they had been chasing. Signal strongest just past that ridge, and with any luck, we should be seeing the source any second now, Serena told him, counting down the distance while looking out at the scene in front of her. Mike glided the venture towards a location, wondering what it was. Could it be a probe or damaged satellite? After all, no known craft had made it this far beyond Luna in recorded history. Oh my god, Mike spoke out. That's not possible, Serena added, both of them looking on in shock and confusion at the sight before them, sitting, drifting in the orbital gravitational pull of a rather large-looking asteroid, sat an arrowhead-class ship, powerless and almost devoid of any signs of life. The hull looked charred, cracked, and ripped in places. Panels had been torn away. Sections of the tail fins had been broken and were missing completely. The engines appeared to be in need of repair, and from what they could see from when their beam lamps focused on the tip cockpit section, it was dark, and what appeared like frost and ice clung to the interior, yet what concerned them most was the name of the ship. D.S.V. Venture. Mike, what the hell? Seriously, what the hell? Serena exclaimed. I wish I knew, Serena. Mike answered, not knowing what to think or make of the situation. Mike had no idea of what to do or how to explain what he was seeing. Everything he had come to know about space had just been thrown out the window, and now he was in unknown territory, and his mind was racing with wild theories, just to try and explain what he was seeing, without any scientific proof to back any of it up, ranging from time slipping to as far flung as aliens, or even further, that maybe his theory of an anomaly from the missing, destroyed planet had something to do with it. He made two full passes of the crippled venture, just to see if there was anything that could explain this, hoping that if they'd missed something the first time, they could catch it on the second run. Yet nothing would help them in identifying the mystery that lay in front of them. 
Once they had exhausted their physical observations, they knew they both needed to look deeper, beyond what they could see, to what they couldn't. Serena, see if you can access the other Ventures systems. See if you can find out what happened over there. Mike asked. Serena set about trying to establish some sort of connection, yet every attempt to do so was met with access denied, flashing across her screen. Yet, she continued to try, using every method of hacking she knew to gain entry, even thinking about codes that she herself might have inputted to block any attempt at gaining forced entry. Yet every method was greeted with the same outcome. In frustration, she slammed her hands down on the panels. Damn it! Nothing! I'm blocked out of every attempt, she stated. Looks like we're going to have to do this a hard way. Not how I wanted to go about it, but needs must, Mike told her, knowing that their only option left to them now was boarding the stricken venture to try and find out what had happened. Both Mike and Serena readied themselves, each having misgivings and trepidation as to what lay before them. It concerned them as to what had happened to themselves, or what state that they would find the inner workings of the ship, but they both knew that they couldn't leave a mystery like this unsolved. Once they were ready in their spacesuits, Mike remotely guided their venture to docking with the other venture, both vessels coming together, joining as one, back to back, in perfect symmetry. They both waited in their airlocks for the signal before attempting to gain access. At first it appeared that the controls to unlocking the hatch of the venture wouldn't release that Mike had to pry the handle and system from the outside. Seriously, Mike, this already doesn't look good if the airlock's jammed, Serena mentioned. We have to go on. Something happened here, Mike informed her, giving her a concerned look. After prying the handle of the airlock, finally giving way, opening up, gaining them access into the interior of the ship, the interior rear compartment was that of engineering. Ice crystals hung in a vacuum of space. Loose equipment drifted uncontrollably in the airy silence. Out the corner of her eye line, Serena saw a figure floating off towards the far corner of the workhouse and proceeded over to investigate, finding it to be an unused spacesuit, drifting, having come away from its housing berth. At first, she had been cautious, almost afraid to turn the spacesuit over, hoping that she wouldn't find either herself or Mike inside of it. Yet, she had been thankful it wasn't, yet nervous as to where they both were on this craft. I get a feeling something bad happened here, Serena posed. Agreed. Mike stated, trying to find the station and consoles that would bring power back to the venture. As Mike looked and began to tinker around with various circuits, trying to regain power, Serena stayed close to him, around the area. She'd never once been afraid of any part of the venture, and yet now in the darkness of the crippled vessel, every shadow seemed to cast an evil presence as if the very ship itself was watching them, as if trying to tell them to get out and to go back. Every creak and groan seemed to amplify and give the impression that the figures were moving in the darkness. Serena kept a lookout, not letting her mind run away with her, trying to push away shadows as they appeared in vain, hoping to keep her composure. It was as she did this. Something caught her attention among the ice particles. A silvery, almost wet, or crystalline substance clung to a wall section between two relay stations. She followed it upwards towards the ceiling before seeing something dot out of the light, making her recoil in shock. What? What is it? Mike asked, turning away from his work. I... I don't know, 
Something just moved on the ceiling, Serena replied. Both of them turned their spacesuit beams towards the ceiling. Serena's heart was still racing from what she'd just caught a glimpse of. Moments later, the same spacesuit Serena had seen upon first inspection floated into view. Just a spacesuit, Serena. Mike mentioned, returning back to the panel, adjusting a few diodes and circuitry before closing the panel, activating the console. The power to the lights was the first thing to flicker back on. A couple of the neon tubes burst and sparked back off, sending a patchwork of areas back into dim darkness. This was followed by stations coming back online. Come on, let's explore this mystery, Mike added as he proceeded to make his way towards the next section of the venture. Yet Serena was sure she'd seen something other than the spacesuit, and that image wouldn't leave her mind. The canteen area was awash with objects that floated throughout. It seemed that nothing here had been secure. Plates, cutlery, and food now displayed the icy crystalline markings. Data pads floated gently, knocking into other objects before going in another direction. And yet still there was no signs of life, nothing that showed any indication of a struggle or what happened. Even the data pads had little to no charge on them, making accessing the information upon them extremely difficult in the current environment. Pocketing them for further study, they both proceeded into their own sleeping quarters, noting various things that might give any idea as to the date and time this craft was from. Or Mike could tell, as he looked at his quarters, was that he appeared to be a few chapters ahead in a book he was reading, and nothing else. All was too quiet. His attention was broken when he sat skimming through the book. He heard a noise coming back from the canteen. He poked his head out of his quarters, noting that Serena had also heard a noise. Go check on the cockpit. See if you can download any data. Then we leave. I'm getting that feeling, like you, that we shouldn't be here, Mike said. Once Serena had left, Mike made his way back into the canteen area, looking around, trying to find anything that might have caused the sound he'd heard. It had almost sounded like something crashing against another metallic object, like when pans land on floors. Yet, from what he could tell, all the cutlery was floating. Nothing appeared to have hit the floor. It was, however, as he turned his attention towards the engineering compartment that he noticed the grill grate towards the ceiling had been ripped from its housing, as if something had burst through, leaving an icy crystalline trail. He followed it with his spacesuit lamp, tracing a path across the ceiling, before seeing a tendril for a brief second, before he then felt something tighten across his waist, yanking him from the ground, and then nothingness, almost a peaceful, serene calmness, before searing pain, followed by suffocation. Serena made her way into the cockpit area, and gave her out a sigh of relief to find that the systems were now activated once more. She noticed that the automated distress beacon was the root cause that had brought them here, and so decided to switch it off before going through the files for downloading. It was as she looked at the files, they were dated only a few days after their own arrival within the belt. The last recorded entry had been made by Mike. This is possibly my last entry. I have no idea if this will ever reach anyone, or if you'll ever see this, but I have to put this down. We, um, we made a mistake venturing off from our assignment, coming to the belt to investigate the signal. It should have been a warning. We found a ship floating adrift on the far side of the belt. Something like we'd never seen before. 
it wasn't metallic or an earth-based construction at all. It seems something akin to a biological ship, huge in scale. The venture compares to that of one of its shuttles. We entered onto it, not knowing what we would find. Serena took data readouts. She was trying to crack the code and understand their language. I say was. That is because something grabbed her as we made our way back to the venture. It tore her off the ground and swallowed her whole. This creature is totally see-through. And I can still see her, struggling to break free. What a thing dissolved her. I managed to make it back to the venture with that thing on my ass. But it took hold of the ship, tearing and ripping it, trying to gain entry. I managed to escape, but I can only hope that mankind never find this craft or where it came from. As for me, I know I'm dead. Fuel is about gone, and supplies will be long since used up before any help arrives. I'm going to activate the Venture's destruction sequence. It's untested, and hopefully will work. And if by some chance it doesn't, please understand. We should never have opened that door. Mike out. Serena couldn't believe what she was hearing. Somehow, they had or to find a craft from another world, and would both end up dead. She kept reading through the files, trying to see if there was any reason why the auto-destruct hadn't happened. Then she found it. Somehow, the drive had exploded, but instead of destroying the venture, the resulting explosion and asteroid's gravitational harmonics had opened up a time fissure, pulling the venture back in time. Serena finished downloading the files and quickly headed back to the canteen to find Mike. As Serena opened the door to the canteen, she could see a beam of light pointing towards the floor. She followed it back to its source, coming to look at a viscous, hideous, blob-like creature with tendrils protruding from its surface. From within its body, Serena could see Mike, half dissolved his skin having been peeled away, and now nothing more than sinew, bone, and ligaments were in the process of being dissolved. That was when she saw two overgrown huge eyes scanning the area and coming to rest upon her. The creature let out a horrific screech before grabbing her, giving her no chance to escape the area. Hello Sparkshort fans, and to those just finding the channel, welcome. You are about to embark on a tale of one man's final report. So pull up a chair, sit back, relax, and listen to the tale you are about to be told. But before that, if you could please hit the like and subscribe button. It's a small thing to ask, but it really helps out the channel to grow and keep you informed of any and all upcoming stories. Thank you for now, and on with the story. This is the last report of Captain Andrew Matthews, operating out of Lunar Outpost 1. What the hell did I just witness? The computer is telling me that there are no signals being transmitted from command back on Earth. And I have no idea what to do now. I have no idea if this recording will ever reach anyone, or if I'm just making this for prosperity's sake. Hmm. <laughs> Funny. I may be the last of humanity, making this 
for any form of life that finds our world in the future. I've already come to terms with my fate. I'll never be leaving here again. The oxygen will long run out and in turn become poisonous before anyone arrives, which only leaves me with two choices, quick or slow. But before I make that call, let me tell you what has happened. This world you're standing on, that you have found, drifting through the galactic cosmos, once orbited a planet rich and teeming with life. Its oceans were a dazzling hue of crystal blue. Its lands, a myriad of color, ranging from lush green fields, yellow pastures of wheat and deserts, coastlines, and at night, the skyline would be lit up with big metropolises, beacons for all to see. The stars would twinkle and shine on clear clouds nights. You could make out the constellations of Orion, Great and Small Bear, the Southern Cross, and many more. In the early years of our history, seafarers would use the stars to guide them across the oceans, and the tribes of the land would use them to track the seasons. And sitting biggest and proud of them all was the world of our moon. It controlled the ebbs and flows of the tides and gave us life. Many of our Earth scientists believed that our moon was born out of an impact of two worlds, ours and another called Thea. Our history wasn't the best, but I guess the same can be said for anywhere out there in the grand universe. At first, our world was ruled by creatures you would come to know as dinosaurs, and they existed for hundreds of millions of years until they were wiped out by an asteroid. Over time, humanity evolved. We were tribal and nomadic at the beginning. And as our species grew, we developed language, art, culture, and unfortunately war. For a species as young as ours, we had a mastery over using weapons of war always finding new and inventive ways to destroy, butcher, and name others, all in the name of peace. Yet from such conflicts came discoveries and technological advancements, and it was only in the last 200 years that as we as a species went from cars, vehicles which traveled on the road, the ships which could firstly take to the air and then space. Yet, as we evolved, so too did our weapons of war. Ours were fought over a variety of things land, race, peace, and religion, or sometimes all of the above at the same time. We had survived through two great world wars in the past 200 years, and it seems we couldn't manage a third. In what should have been a time of everlasting peace, a period of reflection and hope to leave our small world and join as one as we all took our first steps among the stars. It appears fate had other plans in store. I had been sent up here by mission command to survey and prepare the ground for the future expansions of our people. This small lunar outpost was to over time grow and become a beacon of humanity. 
in some ways, the first off-world colony. The mission was to last three months before being relieved. So far, I am two months in knowing now this is my home and my world. All had been normal. I had been scouting out the far edges of the crater in my rover, taking readings and placing boundary markers for future studies and growth, as per command's request. As I was busying myself completing the reports, I remember noticing a flash of light in first seeing my helmet. Believing it to be a sun flare cresting over the crater's ridge, I in turn pulled down my visor and carried on recording the findings. It was only after the second flare, which was quickly followed by the third, that I knew something was wrong. And it was then the shock, fear, and realization kicked in as I watched on in horror as bright plumes of mushroom clouds erupted from the earth, one after the other. As each sparked into being, I couldn't help but cry and wail in pain. The world I knew was being destroyed. In desperation, I frantically used the radio, but got only static back. The bombardment of my planet continued for another 10 minutes before going deftly quiet. But that wasn't the worst of it. I watched on as the space stations orbiting the planet began falling towards the surface. I must have sat losing track of time and my mind watching the colors of my world fade behind a blanket of dust and darkness. By the time I'd come back to my senses, I'd been lost in thought for over two hours. Little did I know, in fact, of the damage which was still going on beneath the thick radiation clouds that now enveloped my world. As I sat drinking a farewell to all those that were dead and dying down on the earth, a thick blood-red crimson hue began to crisscross the world, breaking through the grayish darkness, growing in intensity and volume, that I could only sit on in disbelief, as the world I'd known all my life began to bleed and shine with the toxic atmosphere parting, revealing the destruction below. For the world of green and blue I once knew had vanished, leaving in its wake now was a molten fireball of lava, black molten rock. I couldn't recognize anything of my once former world, but this display by my planet would only be fleeting, as once the illuminosity had reached a crescendo, it ripped itself in half, exploding like that of a fireball, hurtling the moon out of orbit and sending it drifting through space, with me as its last surviving remnants of humanity. So if anyone or anything happens to by chance stumble across this wandering moon or find this station and you are able to play back this transmission, know that there was once a planet called Earth and a species known as humanity, one which had so much to give and gave in to the rigors of war. The majority of its people didn't deserve the fate that was inflicted upon it. I can only hope that they died quickly and in no pain. My heart goes out to them 
to those who pressed the nuclear war that destroyed my world. Damn you. So here I sit, having poured myself a drink, raising a toast to all those lost, and to the planet Earth. Once I finish this drink, I intend to blow out the window. With no hope of rescue, and rather than suffer the effects of carbon monoxide, I don't want to call this cowardice, but rather so long. This is Captain Andrew Matthews, signing off.